My name is Stan. We're going to pre flight this airplane and then we're going to take you up in the air. So sit back and fasten your seatbelt. Hey guys, and welcome to another Ben Weeks Bonanza pilot video. Today it's going to be a little different. Um, <clears throat> got this airplane here, uh, 1953 D35 Bonanza. You may recognize or not recognize it from the aer other airplanes on the channel. That's because we picked it up recently from a <clears throat> town kind of nearby, and it is going to an owner in South Dakota. Uh, actually, one of my YouTube subscribers who had found me through the YouTube channel. Um, so I had offered to go ahead and look at the airplane for him. I'd actually already seen it before he even contacted me. Looked at it for somebody else who was interested in Bonanzas. Uh, he didn't end up buying it. This guy did. So he's still a student pilot, still learning to fly. So um, he wanted me to not just check it and make sure everything was operating properly, but also, if possible, make kind of a little instructional video so that he and his instructor would know how to operate the airplane so that he can finish out his training um, in this bonanza. So I was a little hesitant to make this kind of video, at least to post it on YouTube, because I know how it's going to go. Um, I'll do inevitably some things will be different or go against common procedure or this, that, or the other thing. So my disclaimer here is that this is how I operate these bonanzas. I have about 400 hours in them so far. Um, that's not enough time to know if my operation, my operation methods are leading to destruction of cylinders or whatever. Um, so I guess until I get in the thousands of hours, it'll be tough to tell whether the way I operate these bonanzas is correct. Um, my references are, of course, the pilot's operating handbook that you should always look at and verify because a lot of these numbers are going to be off the top of my head. If I tell you something wrong, if the POH says something different, follow the POH. Um, the other source I use is a, there's a Bonanza guru in the Beechcraft community called Lou Gage. Uh, you can find him on beachtalk.com. Uh, he still is pretty active on that forum. He wrote a book uh, that I will link or show somewhere in the video um, on operating. It's everything, not just um, the operating and flying of the Bonanzas, but also how to maintain them, the things to look out for, things to talk to your mechanic about. Um, so he's a very valuable resource. If you're considering getting into these bonanzas, I highly recommend. It's almost required that you get his book. It costs uh, $50, I think, on the American Bonanza Society. All the proceeds go to the American Bonanza Society. Lou Gage isn't making anything off of it. He's done uh, more for the bonanza community than uh, probably all of us combined. So it's very generous of him to share his knowledge. So you can always uh, look at um, you can always go to his book for a resource. Uh, but I'm just gonna kind of give my rundown. I mean, my dad has flown these Bonanzas since the 1980s. Uh, I got into them back in 2016, 2017-ish time. So uh, the way we operate them so far has worked. We fly a lot of different Bonanzas. We've had pretty good success so far. Um, so again, uh, operate at your own risk, but I've flown with people and they do things differently and that's fine. Um, some things are just plain not fine. So hopefully, um, I'll walk you through kind of the, the way I start the airplane, cold starts, hot starts, um, just general operation speeds, um, just little odds and ends preferences I have. So don't think that everything I say is going to be just required. It's just my own preferences. So this is mostly for uh, Clint's benefit. He's going to be taking possession of this airplane here pretty soon, um, him and his instructor. So it'll be their airplane specific, but I'm going to try to generalize it um, to pretty much all of the 1947 through 1956 uh, E-Series Bonanzas. Uh, so if you're looking for how to operate those, uh, there's not a lot of content on YouTube you'll find. So um, this isn't going to be the greatest content, but until somebody else makes a better video, it'll be what you have. So uh, without further ado, I'm just going to kind of go in. I don't know how organized this video will be. I don't have it scripted. I'm just going to kind of walk around and uh, hopefully the YouTube comments will correct things that I get wrong. So this should be a very good building experience. If I get things wrong, people in the comments that are more knowledgeable than I will be able to correct it. So, and also, uh, if you have other questions, go to Beach Talk. I keep talking about Beach Talk, I'll link it or whatever in the video. It is so useful. I do so much of my problems are solved using Beach Talk. It's a fantastic forum. Go join it, become part of the community, and get yourself a bonanza. All right, so I don't really know how else to do this other than we'll just start spinner to tail, and I'll just kind of walk around. Um, 
and just try to talk about things. Again, this probably will not be super organized, but I'm just gonna try to get as much information uh, to you guys as I possibly can. Um, so, propeller. There's only three options currently for, okay, whatever. There's three basic options. There technically are variants of each different option of propeller. Makes it very difficult for having these old uh, E-Series Bonanzas because it can be a little bit difficult to find the prop. This is a Hartzell um, MV propeller. Uh, they call it the MV style. It's a different hub, which you can't really tell the difference um, between the two. But one of the, the early hubs had an AD that required every five years you have to pull uh, the blades off, inspect them for corrosion, check the hub, something or other. I don't know all of the details. I don't care. You send it to a prop shop, pay them money. They tell you it's fine, put it back together, or they tell you there's corrosion and you have to get a whole new prop. So it's kind of a pain. The MV propeller uh, does not have that AD, so it is considered a better propeller. Problem is, it costs about $50,000 for the whole fixings, oil transfer unit, governor, and propeller from Hartzell. They don't want to sell them. They don't want people buying them. They hate the Hartzell propeller. Um, that they had to make for the E-Series Bonanza is not their best product they have ever made. Lou Gage can share more information about why that is. If you look in, I don't know what you're going to be able to see here. Uh, there's the oil transfer unit right up here. So these have a spline crankshaft. Um, I will show you that. Uh, I will. I have whatever. I'll show you a clip that shows what the, the, the crankshaft looks like. Modern aircraft have a crankshaft that has an oil galley that can deliver oil to the prop to change the pitch um, that is built into the crankshaft. The problem is when these aircraft came out they were always intended to use an electric propeller that uses an electric motor to change the uh, pitch. And because of that, there's no way to get oil through to the propeller hub unless you design what they call, I guess, kind of an oil transfer collar um, or oil transfer unit, whatever. And it essentially has like some piston rings in there that allows somehow the oil to travel through but not back into the crankshaft. It builds up pressure like 150 or something PSI. I don't know what the exact amount is, but if engine PSI is only 40 or 45, you obviously have to upregulate that to like 150 or something to be able to change the prop pitch. Higher pressure, I think, makes the prop, yeah, high pressure puts the prop into fine or high RPM pitch and then low oil pressure puts it into course so if you lose an engine you're going to lose your prop control it's going to default to course pitch um, also the blade counterweights are always trying to pull it into course pitch so you have to have oil pressure in order to have takeoff rpm huge pain this is why i don't love these propellers um, you've got the oil delivery line right here this is just the breather engine breather ignore that but that right there is what takes oil from the uh, governor that is in here this little guy right here uh, delivers oil there's the oil line you follow it all the way up sends the oil up into the oil transfer unit and then that oil pushes back into the crankshaft you remove the crankshaft seal that's supposed to block oil from getting out into the hub you actually remove that so that the oil can travel back into the engine so it's not like a closed system it builds up pressure the piston rings keep the oil from all seeping back except at a certain pressure or whatever um, then the governor does its little weird governor things. I'm not an engineer, guys. I'm not a mechanic. I just am kind of talking uh, my basic, pretty poor understanding. There's a T-drive that is like a, it's kind of an adapter that goes where the fuel pump used to go. And then that allows, there's two separate things. One drives the fuel pump, which is back in there. Maybe you can see it. Um, and then, so one is the governor, one is the fuel pump before the fuel pump mounted directly to the accessory case makes it really congested in here but it's whatever it is what it is that's why i prefer the electric prop but i'll continue you probably hear me say that i prefer the electric prop like a million times because i do also if you look past the governor to that little silver looking thing that is the plain power alternator which is the coolest upgrade ever it's i think a 50 amp um alternator and it is way better than the generators. The generators are great. They're very easy to work on, but they have so many problems. We have had endless issues with uh, the generators. The alternator is way better. Um, so that's what you've got, Clint. So congratulations, you got a super awesome. I actually ran these uh, incandescent bulbs that draw like 25 amps a piece. Um, they're not even LED. I had them both on and it was still at like, I want to say 13.1 volts or something. So it was actually still charging the battery rather than discharging, even with just outrageous uh, draw from the electrical system. So plain power alternator probably costs you $2,500 to $3,000 to get the whole parts and labor to get it put on. Super good upgrade though, super worth it.
Uh, these engines are the, this is the E225-8 engine, 225 horsepower. There's the E185-11, that's 205 horsepower, or earlier E engines that I'm not super familiar with, but they, some are 185 horsepower, some are 194, um, there's, or 195 or something like that. Again, numbers are estimations, they're not exact. Uh, but that's this engine. It is a, uh, I want to say dry sump. Dry sump means that the engine itself doesn't keep the oil. This has an oil cooler externally mounted. Um, so your oil is in here. You want to check this obviously before every flight. You don't want to put more than about eight quarts in there because if you put any more than eight quarts, for some reason, these e-engines will just spit it all out through the engine breather and it'll all end up on the belly. Um, so that's in Lou Gage's book. Um, this aircraft, usually the, the thing to note with these aircraft is that the after you shut down and the engine cools down, the oil will actually leak back down into the engine case because for some reason the check valves do not, all, all these bonanzas, the oil leaks past the check valve and gets back into the engine. So you'll go check your oil cold and you'll be like, oh my goodness, uh, why am I only reading like barely halfway up the chain on here? Uh, it doesn't mean you lost all your oil. It means until you run the engine, get it hot and get all the oil back in, um, it won't read accurately. This aircraft, however, is cold and it still reads accurately. And that's because the previous owners changed or fixed the check valve and made it to where it actually reads correctly. So congratulations, previous owners, you guys did a good job. But here's like the little cooling air vent thing goes through here. Um, some people have trouble getting their uh, oil very um, warm in the winter time. So uh, Clint, you're up in South Dakota. It's cold weather. You might have to tape off some of this. Check your oil temps. I found that the oil temperature runs pretty warm on this engine. So you may not have to worry about that. Uh, otherwise, uh, down here, where you're going to change your oil. Uh, after you want to run it, get the oil warm, but not hopefully not steaming hot, but warm enough that it flows really well. This is a little uh, oil funnel thing that you're going to want to take off this gill plate and drain all your oil out here into a bucket. You'll make a giant mess. Uh, we always do. We try not to, but we do. Um, there's also a, down here, there is a, I'm going to like circle it or zoom in on it. There's a little nut there. That's how you empty out whatever's in the case. Uh, you got your gear doors. You want to check these, make sure they're not um, falling off. Here's your nose gear. It's a nose gear. It's a strut. You can air it up, up uh, somewhere in here. There's maybe you'll see it. I don't know. I'm just sticking my camera up there. Uh, that's how you can air up the strut if you need to. This is pretty good um, level. I would actually. I mean, they say you want like four fingers, which is about what this is. I prefer it just a little bit higher, but that's because I do a bunch of off-airport um, in the weeds and rocks and junk, and so I like a little higher strut. Uh, your air filter is in here. It's a nasty, gunky thing. You take off these screws, change your oil filter, change it once a year, um, unless you want to tear up your engine cylinders with grit and stuff. Uh, so you got your cow flaps here. Um, Things are not really quite operating properly. We have to do some adjustment on them. I don't know what the deal is, but it makes it hard to keep the cylinders cool. Cow flaps aren't really opening very well. Uh, this is as old as the hills. I think this is your boost pump. It is massive and it's, I don't know, I hate it. But it's there, so if we have to work on anything back there, it makes it even harder to get back behind the engine. Uh, you got your starter right here. Um, it's a really good starter. It pulls the uh, prop around really well. You got the slick magnetos, which is cool. Uh, some people have Bendix. These appear to be slick, I believe. So good magnetos, great magnetos. I think there's no ADs against them. Here's your brake fluid reservoir. Fill it with uh, that red hydraulic fluid stuff if your brakes are getting spongy. Um, it is so stinking cold. Oh my goodness. Uh, that pretty much does it for the engine compartment, at least enough for um, what you guys need to know for basic operation. If you want to get into like the whole mechanicing of everything, there's your spin on oil filter adapter kit. That's the Airwolf, I believe, uh, adapter. Uh, Lou Gage, actually, I think he came up with these. Um, it's really good, cool design. That way you can check your oil. Um, it's a lot better. The other ones, some may just have a screen that you take out and it doesn't have as fine of uh, like holes in it so it can theoretically let metals get through that a normal oil filter would not so it's better to have the oil filter or so the saying goes uh, although my dad does not have the oil filter and we haven't had any trouble with it uh, okay so 
obviously you guys know a basic walk around. I'm not gonna like insult your intelligence by like doing a walk around. Be like, oh, here's how you check your prop for blah, blah, blah. Uh, do your walk around, whatever. Um, you check your fuel. Uh, let's see, there is something to say about the fuel system. This is, I'm checking the right tank right now. I like auto fuel. You can run av gas, whatever, if you want to have your lead fouling on your plugs all the time. Uh, but this is your checking your fuel. A little secret that I have done. It may be different if you have a different chain link, so you might your results may vary. But I have found that if I take this chain, because there's no obviously there's no dipstick, you'd have to make one yourself. But I found that if I take this chain and I get the little figure eight looking link and I match it perfectly to this little edge of the skin. The bottom of the, oh, you're not going to probably be able to see that very well, but the bottom of the little chain T thing, that should touch the bottom of the, or the top of the fuel. If it just barely touches, that is essentially 10 gallons, plus or minus, more or less. That's a nice little way. I can't give you any other gradations, but I can at least tell you that if it's at the bottom of the little metal thing at the bottom of the chain, uh, if the fuel level is at the bottom, whenever you have a little figure eight piece on the edge of the skin that should be roughly 10 gallons so use that as you will if you have a different chain length it's going to be different um, but at least it's a little something you can consider uh, i am going to show you guys because like for instance in clint's case he's not used to a retractable gear airplane he hasn't had to do a pre-flight on it so i'm going to kind of show you the things i look for up in here first off this is your squat switch kind of cool uh that's supposed to keep you from if you accidentally raise your gear instead of your flaps when you're taxing back to your hangar that is supposed to keep it from raising the gear problem is then you'll be on takeoff and you'll get a little weight off of the squat switch and it'll still fold up before you're fast enough to fly away and you'll still gear up your airplane so i don't really know what purpose that serves but it's there uh okay up here this is your little up lock. No, this is your up lock roller. Um, you wanna check this, it's a little bearing thing. Sorry if I'm throwing you guys all around. You wanna make sure that's all greasy, nasty, and spinning freely. Uh, this is a little spring. No, this is like, this is the up lock spring. This little thing goes and it, the roller runs up against this little up lock stop type thing. You have to check your clearances there. Anyways, all that is irrelevant. That's more mechanic-y stuff. All you need to know is that this spring, if it breaks, it will allow this to like somehow stick like all the way through the wing up here. And a lot of Bonanzas you'll find have damage or old repairs um, because the spring broke. So check your springs, change them. Everybody says change your springs. I like to give it a little springy, springy dingy thing here. And okay, it's good. So that's what I check there. I check the roller, I check the spring. I look generally to make sure the strut is still there. Okay, that's a gear check. See, it's not that hard to have a retractable gear airplane. It's not really that much more difficult of a pre-flight. Okay, just let me check that. You do the same to the other side, obviously. Um, up here on the nose, like, I don't know, whatever. It's all greasy and nasty, but you can push to make sure you're, you got good tension because if that tension is not good at this knuckle elbow thing here, you're gonna end up with your nose gear folding up and destroying your airplane. That has happened, or destroying your engine at least. Uh, people have had taxi incidents. I don't know how they get their gear so out of rig, but if you're worried about that, take it to people who know how to rig a Bonanza and rig the gear. So other side, um, do the same thing. Uh, oh, four, okay, that was the right tank. Right tank is not your main tank. Got 20 gallons, 17 usable, whatever, on your right tank. Left tank, this is very important. Left tank, not right tank. Left tank is your main tank. So you should always be flying, if you have full tanks, you should always be flying from your left tank first. Because, let's see if I can get this thing at the open. Whoop. Whatever, there, see this doesn't work, my little method here, because the thing is not sticking all the way down. So you can't really check your fuel using my little method, but there's more than 10 gallons, I can tell you that much. Anyways, uh, sorry, my distractible brain. Uh, what I was saying is left tank is your main tank. What does that mean? It means that these uh, engine, fuel pump, or whatever, the fuel system delivers about 13 gallons an hour or so to the carburetor slash fuel system of the engine. Um, it only needs, say, 10 gallons, whatever gallons per hour. It essentially delivers more fuel to the carburetor than it needs um, per hour. There's a return line that sends all of that extra fuel all the way back 
um, to the left tank. Now I am talking out of my uh, knowledge base here. I don't know if the reason they do that is like for cooling or if it has to do with just adding a reserve to your, like an automatic reserve back to the airplane. I do not know why they deliver more fuel than they need, but they do. People get upset about it, deal with it. Your left tank is your main tank. Um, so if you are flying from your right tank and you have a topped off left tank, what are you gonna be doing? You're gonna be sending three gallons per hour overboard through the overflow line and you're gonna be losing it out the back of the airplane. Uh, which is fine. I mean, it might be a slight fire hazard. I don't know how there'd be enough heat back there to cause any flames, but it's going to make a big mess and you're going to feel stupid and you're going to just be buying extra fuel. So burn off of your left tank first, otherwise you will be sending fuel overboard. So burn maybe like half an hour on the left tank, then switch to your right tank for half an hour and switch back, whatever, do it however you want to do it. Point is, do not lose precious fuel overboard because you were running on your right tank instead of your left tank. Left tank is main tank. Okay, this one also, I don't know if you can see back there, there's a little door. This has the 20 gallon um, uh, auxiliary tank. And so this has some 60-ish gallons, not quite, because some of it's unusable. Um, I will show you the kind of clogs up the baggage compartment, but it is nice um, because with just 40 gallons in these airplanes, there's really not as much use. You barely get three and a half hours of flight time. So this right here is the um, 20 gallon ox tank. Some may have a 10 gallon tank that only sits like way down here, which is also kind of useful. It gives you an extra hour of flight time, more or less. Uh, so that's in there. You fill it to the other side. You can see the little tube that goes up to the outside. Here's your firewall thing. It's kind of got a little cover. You can look back in there where your uh, ELT and all that stuff will be. Uh, but that's your baggage compartment. Oh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, you got your flaps, you got your ailerons. That's all pretty self-explanatory. Um, your tail, the scary, scary V-tail, oh my. Um, but here it is, so check it. Make sure it's not falling apart. This one's oil canning a little bit. Uh, but you just wanna make sure the tail's on, you don't want that falling off, because you know, that's what V-tails do is fall off, right? Uh, this thing is parked in such a way that I can't really get great access to the rudder vader, so I'm gonna try to stumble around and see if I can get back there. Oh, this is probably a mistake. Okay, perfect. Well, that was actually easier than I thought it would be. Uh, rudder vaders, make sure they are attached. These ones are in great condition. There's a little bearing thing up there that can get loose. So you wanna kind of translate it back and forth up and down and this one's got a little rattle to it how is this one that one feels better so actually there's like a bearing up here uh, we kind of need to change it on my dad's airplane as well but go up and down with it and that bearing might be wearing someplace makes it they're like a hundred dollars per uh i think it's like per bearing but you might want to change those check your trim tabs um, because these little nut deals on here, uh, some people get them too tight. You want to make sure that that can, hey guys, I'm recording a YouTube video. Sorry, I'm being all weird. If these are too tight, you can bind up your trim tab cable and cause all kinds of problems. So you want to make sure those spin freely by hand. These ones are slightly tight, but they still spin freely. So you want to make sure those are good on both ends. Uh, otherwise, whatever, trim tab. This has your little tail beacon. Rudder vader, rudder vader. That's all there really is to worry about. So that pretty much covers, like, I guess sort of the walk around of the airplane. Let me try to get out of here again. Uh, got your step. Some of them are retractable, some of them are fixed. Um, it is so stinking cold out here. Uh, but that's kind of your basic rock around. Um, and again, some airplanes may have tip tanks. You may have extra fuel here. Some don't. Uh, rotating beacon. Uh, anything else? No. I think that covers it. Man, this takes so long. Um, nobody is going to sit through this, but that's fine. This is for Clint and his instructor and anybody else that finds it useful. Uh, anything more that I'm missing? If, anyone, if I forgot anything, put in the comments what I'm forgetting, what I should tell owners about. Um, I think we're gonna, I'm gonna warm my hands a little bit and then I'm gonna go into the cockpit and we'll talk about some things there. 
Okay, I knew there was uh, something I was forgetting uh, to tell you guys. It is a really cold, ugly, miserable day today. It's getting down. Probably going to get about 40 degrees, and the wind chill is going to be closer to 36 degrees. That's why my hands are freezing to death. Um, so today will be a day that we want to preheat the airplane. Uh, the way you preheat, do it however you want. I don't care. Um, some have built-in preheater things that will heat the oil, whatever. My cheap redneck way to do this is with a little uh, space heater from Amazon. I will leave the link of this one, um, this design that I got. It, it changes the cheap Chinese brand that does it. They, it changes like every month. I don't know why those companies do that. So this is going to become outdated very quickly. But if you look for this type of heater, the reason I get it is because it fits um, quite well um, into the engine compartment. So it has a little element. You can hear it firing up. It's going to turn all red. Probably a fire hazard. Use it at your own risk. I haven't burned anything down yet. The reason I like this heater is it fits pretty well right down kind of in here. Heat rises, so I try to... This is going to be hard to do with holding the camera at the same time. But the, the goal is to stick it... Oh, this stupid thing. The goal is to have the thing heating your engine oil, right? So I'm going to put it in something like this. Keep in mind that this whole engine compartment, everything should be like heat rated up to like 300 degrees or better. So I'm not super worried about being too close to things. Metal components are fine. Uh, rubber could get kind of hot, but I don't think I will melt the rubber. I'll put it like this. Okay, so now it's kind of blowing up towards my oil cooler. Uh, I don't know how well I'll get this preheated. I like to heat anything below 40 degrees or below. That's kind of the rule of thumb um, is you like to preheat the oil. So that's blowing onto the oil uh, coolers already. And it's also warming my hands because my hands are so stinking cold right now. I should have worn some gloves. But that is heating your oil. I ran my little cable out through here. Um, if it's a small enough extension cord, you can actually Sorry about that. You can actually kind of shut the cowling. And I usually try to get one of these to latch, and I'm not going to be able to do this very well while holding the camera. That one is not going to work, so maybe the front one here. Yeah, there we go. So I got that locked in, and it's not a perfectly tight seal, but it's going to keep some of that heat in there. In addition to that, I put some blankets. I'm not going to show that. I'll show the end once I have the blankets because I cannot do this one-handed. But I put these blankets on. That keeps some of the heat. Heat rises. It's all going to be in, circulating nicely in this little engine compartment. And that's how I preheat. So you can use another method, whatever. It works for me. It may not work for Clint and his, like, however cold it gets up in South Dakota. Probably pretty stinking cold. But it works for us around here in the southern Missouri where the climate tends to be a little more mild. Okay, so here's kind of the finished product. Uh, as you can see, it's not the fanciest job ever. I kind of stuff the blankets in there. I don't know why I have to show you. You guys know how to put a blanket over the top. The point is, is I'm not covering the whole bottom, so I'm having some heat loss there, but heat rises, so I'm just trying to maximize the amount of heat that is staying in kind of this top foot of the cowling. So there you go. Okay, now we are getting into kind of the cabin of the airplane here. Got a standard four seat configuration that's gonna look pretty identical in most Bonanzas. Some may have a third window, some may not. Just depends. So another thing you can do if you're in a really cold climate, I have done sometimes is take one of those space heaters and actually run two extension cords, run one space heater in the cabin here to warm it up and the other one in the engine compartment. Um, it just depends on how cold it really gets in your area. Do what you wanna do. Uh, okay, so here is where you're going to get a huge amount of diversity between different airplanes. So I, I can show you stuff like where the circuit breakers are laid out. It's going to be different on all your airplanes. What will pretty much be the same is you're going to have a battery and a generator switch. In this case, you have a battery and an alternator switch, uh, but you have essentially two switches are your master switch as opposed to the one that you may be used to on most airplanes. Um, usually they're like way over here. In this case, this has like a, your boost pump here um, switch, but usually you have like a little panel, circuit breaker switch panel thing. As your switches, battery and, and generator will be on your side, uh, the far left side. Just find out where they are on your airplane. In this case, Clint, you have a battery alternator. You 
turn those on. People have had trouble. They think that they can turn on the key over here and turn it to both and then just fire up. It's not going to work. You have to turn on your battery. You have to turn your master switch, which is your battery and generator or battery and alternator switch together. Um, otherwise, you got a bunch of circuit breakers. Learn your circuit breakers. I'm not going to go over that too much. The important ones to note is the landing gear circuit breaker. Uh, which these are not labeled well. I need to find out on this airplane which one those are. Oh, here it is. Okay, gear. Find out what one that is because if you have a problem in flight, you're going to want to pull your, your circuit breaker out before you use the manual crank, which is down here. Before you use this manual crank, you do not want to spin that without first pulling the circuit breaker. Uh, the reason for that... I'm sorry, i got the sniffles. It's really cold out here. The reason you do not want to crank the gear handle down without first pulling your circuit breaker is if your gear motor is malfunctioning, it's an electric motor that cycles the gear on these airplanes, um, and you start spinning, it may just be a dead spot on the motor, and if you spin at a certain distance, it will kick on, and then that motor uh, handle crank is going to spin like a million miles an hour, it's going to bust your knuckles, bust up your hand, and you're going to have a really bad day, and then you're going to have to land one-handed. So pull your circuit breaker. If you have to manually lower the gear, you don't ever raise the gear with the handle, you only lower it. But if you have to lower the gear because your gear motor stopped working, pull your landing gear circuit breaker, crank it all the way down. And it's like 50 turns, it takes forever. So hopefully you don't have like an engine failure situation, but it's gonna take you 50 turns. Do 50 turns, uh, I don't remember which direction. I will, I will post that here, what the direction is. I always forget. It's one of the directions, the way that it goes easy, the other way it won't go down at all obviously because it's the wrong direction. So you pull the circuit breaker, you crank the gear down. Once you think you have it, I mean, try to turn until it just won't turn anymore, then you should have it down. To verify, you're gonna wanna push the circuit breaker, make sure your hands are clear, make sure you have the gear handle stowed again, but you're gonna wanna push the gear uh, circuit breaker back in. The reason for that is that you wanna come over here and you wanna check that your gear down light is on. That's gonna be your best indication that the gear is down and locked. So pull the circuit breaker out to kill the gear motor in case it does kick on, crank your gear down, temporarily push the circuit breaker back in, verify that you have a light, then pull the gear circuit breaker back out, go land, do your thing, um, and then you can troubleshoot it and then put the circuit breaker, but do not push the circuit breaker back in until you know that you like have the aircraft on jacks and stuff and you know that's not going to fold the gear up on you or something. Also, you want to make sure, <laughs> sorry, the other thing to, to clarify, you've got your landing gear switch right here. Um, you're going to want to put it, say you had your gear up because you're flying, you put the gear down, it doesn't go down, you maybe toggle it once or twice, doesn't work, whatever. At that point, make sure you pull the circuit breaker, but make sure the landing gear, because you can crank it down regardless of the position of the switch, make sure that switch is in the down position. You do not want to accidentally leave that in the up position, crank it down manually, pull your circuit breaker, whatever, and then you accidentally push the circuit breaker back in while you're on the ground and it tries to raise the gear on you. It shouldn't because you have those squat switches, but it might, you can have all kinds of problems. So make sure, let me talk through this slowly because I ramble and I talk too fast. You're flying. Your landing gear does not come down. What is the procedure? Pull the landing gear circuit breaker out to kill the circuit breaker. When you push in, in means it's good and it means the motor can run. Pull it out so that the motor cannot run. You do not want the motor to run because you're going to reach back here in flight. You are going to unstow your little thingy majigger here and you're going to crank it down whichever direction. Um, brings the gear down, you're going to stow it back, you now should have a gear arrow down here, this little red arrow should be down at the very bottom, that means your gear is down. To verify, after you've cranked the gear down, you push the circuit breaker back in, and then you look immediately over and you verify that you have a gear down light. At that point, you know your gear is down, you have a light and an arrow that is telling you your gear is down. At that point, you will check your landing gear switch, make sure it's in the down position, then you will pull the circuit breaker back out, you will land, you will take it to your mechanic, you will fix the landing gear on jacks. Make sure you do not leave the landing gear in the up position, the landing gear switch, um, when you have a gear issue. So there, that was a very belabored um, instruction on how to do the landing gear. Also, do not 
get confused between your landing gear light and your flap down light. I don't know why they even have these. Who cares what your stupid flap position is? It's irrelevant. Tape over these, do whatever you gotta do. Do not be fooled. This is your gear down, this is your gear up light. This light is so stinking important. So don't be confused. Gear down, gear on this side, gear lights. Flap over here on this side, flap lights. Um, and that kind of segues into the next point. I'm gonna actually sit in here. Sorry if I'm breathing heavy, I'm out of shape. And it's cold. I'm just gonna go ahead and shut this door. Maybe that will conserve some of my body heat. Okay, so we're in the airplane. It's really tight quarters in here. I'm sorry about that. Gear flaps. Okay, everybody gets so hung up on gear and flaps. Do not confuse them. Here is the important thing to remember. It's difficult to see, but right here where my finger is, that is a little safety switch. There is also one on here. Okay, to lower your flaps, to lower your flaps, you have to push the safety over with your finger. You have to lower the flap. I'm gonna do it here. Okay, your flaps will lower. To raise the gear, I'm not going to do this, but I will pretend to raise the gear, you have to move the safety and then flip the gear switch up, your gear will come up. If this safety switch is not pulled over, this thing will not go to safety. Okay, so to raise your gear, you have to move your switch safety thing over. To lower your flaps, you have to pull the safety over. Now, the important distinction here, to raise the flaps, you do not have to move the lever. Do not touch the little safety lever if you are raising your flaps. There is a rule we say. We say it verbally like, like doofuses. We scream it out like, we're, like we ride the short bus to school. We say, flaps up one finger. Flaps up one finger. Now I can raise my flaps because it will not go down without the safety switch. It will go up with one finger. So what do we say? Class flaps up one finger. If I fly with you, if I smell you from another state using two fingers to lift your flap, I will come, I will find you, and I will take away your airplane keys. When you raise your flaps, flaps up one finger. Say it audibly, one finger. And then you will not absolutely accidentally raise your landing gear because you thought it was the flaps because you used one finger. Flaps up one finger. And it, you act like I'm stupid. I may be repeating this too many times. Flaps up one finger. <laughs> Guys, it is not that hard. You will not accidentally raise your gear while you're on taxi, on your rollout, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna put my flaps back up and use two fingers, whatever. Don't do it. Flaps up one finger. I don't care if you're on the runway. I don't care if you just touch down. If you always touch the flap lever with one finger, you will not accidentally raise your gear. Okay. <laughs> I was so stinking preachy on here. Okay. Sorry about that. It's just so important, okay? Gear, people make such a big deal. Some of the early Bonanzas do not have this little, I think this started with the D model, having the little, you can probably change your piano keys. It has a little half wheel, has a little flap. It doesn't matter. My dad's B35 does not have that. It just, they both are identical. They're just labeled differently. Gear is on one side, flaps are on the other. Sometimes in the heat of battle, I'm coming into land and I accidentally go for my flaps to put those down instead of my landing gear. And that's not the end of the world if you accidentally put your flaps down like at a, a speed higher. It's supposed to be 105. Um, the bottom of the white arc is your flap speed. So if you're at 125, which is your gear speed, and you accidentally lower your flaps, not the end of the world. Um, so that's fine. Sometimes you get confused. As long as you make sure your light is down and any arrow is down, if you accidentally put your gear down and you did your gumps, you say, oh, okay, I'm coming into land. I'm going to configure. So gun, going through my gumps, uh, gear down. Um, but I accidentally put my flaps down and said, um, and then I go, okay, so I'm gonna do my gumps check. Gas is on the left or the right, whatever, the fullest main tank. I'm gonna check my fuel gauge. I'm gonna check my little fuel selector down here. It's indicating uh, it's on the left tank here. Up is right tank, down is left tank. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but there's only one gauge. 
right here, only one fuel gauge, which covers three tanks. So down is left tank, up is right tank. Also importantly, the aux tank is right here. And if you flip that up, it will override both your left and right tanks. So you'll think you're running out of fuel. Or if you have a full tank, you'll think you have a, fuel, a full tank when you're actually running your left tank or right tank down. So make sure this is off. Um, anyway, so you did your gum check. Gas is on the left. It's indicating on the left. Undercarriage is down. Oh, I put my flaps down, not my landing gear. How do I know that I accidentally flipped the wrong switch? Like it like happens, every, happens to everybody. How do I know? Because I don't have a down light and my arrow position down here at my feet is in the up position, so the down position. So gear down, light, arrow. If you don't say gear down, light, and arrow, I'm and I sniff that from wherever you're at, Clint or anybody else, if I hear you saying gear is down and you didn't check your down light and your down arrow, I'm gonna come find you, I'm gonna come take away your keys. Um, so oops, I accidentally, let me fix that. Let me, one finger, always one finger, my flaps back up. And let me come over, put my gear down. Oh, now I've got my gums checked. So undercarriage, down, light, and arrow now. And now I know I, am, I safely have my gear down. And then I slow down the airplane to my 105. I'm on a short field and I lower my flaps. Has to take two fingers to lower. I go land safely and I want to get my flaps back up. What do I do? Flaps up, one finger. Okay, I think I've driven that point home pretty well at this point. Okay, so I think I have probably like belabored the point enough about the flaps, landing gear, rewind the landing gear flap segment as many times as it takes to figure out how to work gear and flaps. I'm not saying you're not accidentally gonna reach for the wrong thing. You will do that, it's just inevitable. Especially if you're sitting on a different side of the airplane, everything's reversed. The key to remember is what all I just said. One finger flaps, always one finger flaps. Okay, so no, I'm not talking about that anymore because I get hung up on it, it's frustrating. Okay, I finally got the key in here. Um, off position, all the way to the left. I don't know how well you can see down here. Yeah, okay. Down position, you've got battery. Left, right, both. Off, battery, left, right, both. Okay, you turn this on, you can hit your little start button so if we can see this over here, start button. Not gonna do anything if your battery and generator slash alternator switch are not on. You need to turn on your masters. I'm not gonna do, well, I will turn on battery right now. Okay, so now we're alive. We got, it's alive, right? So anyways, battery, generator, remember that. Simple things like that, but starting can be kind of difficult. I'm going to go through the start procedure once I got the airplane pulled out. This is kind of just more instructional. Um, I did allude to when we were talking about the gear, the fuel system. So let me see if I can get down here and clarify this a little bit. Okay, so this is down. Your left leg is going to sit right here ish. You're not really going to be able to visually see your. Um, fuel selector system here. This is a wobble pump. It extends, kind of telescopes out. You can use that to prime. If you don't have the boost pump, you can use that to prime it. This is your um, fuel selector. Right now it's on the left tank because the little bitty, not the big paddle, but the little bitty arrow is pointed to the left. Forward in this airplane, and it varies. Some airplanes are backwards on this, but forward is off. Backwards is your baggage tank slash tip tanks if you have them and obviously right is to your right tank so you just point the arrow towards the tank or you shut it off if you need to shut your fuel off in this case we're leaving it uh, on the left tank for now very simple but just know when you're flying you cannot really see very well I mean, you're going to be right here and you're not going to see. You just have to do it by feel. So feel the little tiny pointy arrow and the paddle and switch it to your tank. And then don't forget that when you switch your tank, you only have your one gauge. Some airplanes may have multiple gauges. That's great if they have that. But the standard configuration is just one fuel tank. So make sure that if you're on the left tank, it's down. Down is left. Up is right. This is not labeled, which is annoying. We need to fix that. It should be right, left to kind of tell you like up is right, down is left. But right tank, 
left tank. That will change. You're not going to see it right now. Let's see if we can turn on our battery. And now you see, okay, this is our left tank. Right tank changes a little bit. They're actually kind of similar. Left tank, right tank. Okay, anyways, that's, that's that. Uh, so that's your fuel system. That's gonna be fairly standard. The one thing to note is that this is the later style with the long lever. Um, let me get down where I can show you. I'm gonna kind of tighten here for my big giant contraption. Okay, it's a lever style pump. This is like the C model or D model or whatever on up. Had this style with a separate selector. The early Bonanzas have a T drive or a T style pump that's just a fuel selector and a pump at the same time. It's just got a plunger style pump. And you also turn the plunger either left, forward, off, right to right tank. And then you can pump it up and down. It's very important with those that once you're done pumping to start the airplane, you make sure it's down and locked into position. You should feel the little click because if you get it stuck, you can actually get stuck in between tanks and you can actually starve for fuel. So keep that in mind. Um, learn if you have the other simple T style um, plunger pump, make sure you uh, have it locked into the correct tank. And you should be able to push it down, click it in, and then you should have a little bit of play, but it should not go all the way over without running into resistance. And you should have to force it a little bit to get it over that resistance into the next position. Play with it on the ground, you'll feel the differences um, with the fuel system. That pretty much covers the fuel system. Like I said, you will always want to be on your left tank if you have full tanks because it's going to send three gallons per hour back to your left tank. Okay, so gauge-wise, uh, fuel pressure, you should, I'll give it just one pump or so. I don't want to send fuel spouting out over the overflow, but you should watch the fuel pressure move up. Yeah, okay, so that was a couple pumps, fuel pressure went up. This is a CHT gauge. If you have the standard CHT, it's not going to be super accurate. This is marked in-op because this has a digital CHT gauge right here. Um, so that's what you would reference for your CHT. You also have oil temperature here. You can see the green range. You want the oil temperature to be in the green. Uh, you got oil pressure. It's all self-explanatory. Keep it in the green. Um, on the ground, in this heat of the summer, your oil pressure may run down in the red. It may be close to zero. It may be like five or eight PSI at idle, like a thousand RPMs. Okay, don't freak out. These early bonanzas, they run when the oil gets hot at idle, they run low RPM. You just wanna make sure when you give it full power, that you get back up into the green and they should all run in the green more or less even with 200 degree 215 degree oil hot summer oil when you've been doing touch and goes because you're practicing or whatever don't be afraid of low oil pressure at idle just make sure it comes up when you get up to you know normal operating rpms you have your amp gauge right here that will show charging or discharging if you are if you have your landing lights here both on and you try to cycle your gear in flight and you don't have a plane power 50 amp alternator, if you have the old 35 amp generator, you're probably gonna see it showing discharge, which means it's actually eating your battery power during the cycling until you turn off some of that electrical load because each of these lights is like 25 amps or 20 amps a piece, something like something outrageous or 15 amps, who knows. You've got your radios over there, you've got all this electrical load, so you may be showing discharge. Um, these Bonanzas do not come standard with a volt a voltmeter or voltage gauge. Um, I don't know why that is, but if you have a working cigarette lighter like we do on this airplane, um, we actually powered in um, this whenever you, I'll demonstrate when I turn, turn it to battery, battery on. You can actually see if it's in the right position. That one's kind of finicky, but you can look and you can see that it reads right now it's saying 11.8 because we got electrical systems. So it should be 12.7 or whatever, but because we have electrical load, it's lower than normal battery voltage. Once you start it up, you should be seeing 13.5 to 14.5 volts, somewhere in that range, if your uh, alternator or generator is working. So that's a little handy thing if you want a voltmeter. That's kind of nice. So that kind of covers the electrical system. Um, and this this has a this airplane is nice. It has the digital RPM gauge right there, and it has your digital CHT. Super fancy. They don't all have that, but this one does. So super cool. Um, gauges wise, you got your directional gyro here. 
that's standard. You guys should all be familiar with that. There's no nothing magical about that. Here's your compass that you probably can't see very well. Set your DG to your compass, whatever. Uh, moving up here, you got your airspeed. Um, so speeds. These are all going to fly different. Take your airplane up, stall it, see where it stalls dirty. Um, it's supposed to be top of the white arc should be your stall speed. So 56, 55, 56 miles per hour. They're all going to be different depending on how much load you have. That's at gross weight. Um, different temperatures affect that. So fly your airplane, find out. Um, but roughly around 60 to 70, 60 to 65, 70 is where I'm expecting the airplane to kind of start lifting off. Some of these have a forward CG. So if you're barreling down the runway at 70 miles an hour and you haven't, the airplane hasn't taken off, add a little back pressure and it will lift off for you. So that's your bottom of the, whatever, top of the white arc obviously is your stall speed. If you're a pilot, you know these things already. But just for basics, I lift off at around 60, 65, 70, depending on my configuration, if I have flaps or not. I'm getting airborne, and then the next speed I'm looking at is 80. I want to kind of get to 80, and that's like my climb out speed, kind of VX type thing, type of situation. So I'm putting my gear, once I get to 80, or maybe slightly before 80, if I've got a positive rate of climb, I am gear up. And if I'm clear of obstacles as well, if I'm not clear of obstacles, I might leave my gear down, leave everything alone until I clear the obstacles. That's your own preference. Talk to your CFI, see what they think. But around 80 is what I'm climbing out at initially to get over obstacles. Once I'm clear of obstacles and I want to optimize best rate of climb, I'm speeding up to about 100, 100 miles per hour. If you have the electric prop, 100 to 110 should be kind of your full RPMs give you the best rate of climb, should be wherever that is, 1,000 or 1,500 or whatever. Uh, feet per minute um, so around 100 that's for like the first minute you get full power for one minute with these e-engines after that you're going to want to pull the prop back to 2300 uh, rpms continuous it's different if you have like the early bonanzas look at your poh whatever follow that uh, recommendation um, but the important thing to remember these airplanes is you want to keep them cool these engines get really hot the cylinders do not have as many cooling fins as the later io 470s and stuff so you're going to want to get to 120 as quick as possible lou gage will tell you this in his book um, as soon as you're clear of obstacles and you are have a healthy comfortable altitude you're done with your one minute aggressive climb you're going to want to go transition into a cruise a cruise climb that's at least 120 miles per hour or better to optimize cooling and keeping your cylinder head temperatures as cool as possible um, you want to avoid getting I, I, i'm forgetting exactly what the red line is it may be like 525 Fahrenheit or something is the red line. It may be people try to keep their their CHC below 400. Good luck with that on climb out um, on a hot day, but at least below 450, you're going to want to keep it below there. And then as soon as you get level off in the cruise, you should be able to get your hottest cylinder below 400. Um, otherwise, you might need to pull your power back, whatever. Fix your baffles if you're not getting good cooling. Um, so that's kind of the thing there with climbing out at 100. Um, for the first minute, get over your obstacles, get some air under your wings so that get some altitudes so you have options. Once you are safe above your out uh, and you've used up your one minute and you're safe, then start transitioning as quick as possible into a cruise climb to optimize cooling because you have saved your life by getting altitude. Now save the engine by getting it cool. Um, so that's kind of the airspeed. Uh, next thing is 105, like I alluded to earlier. 105 is your flap speed. Do not lower your flaps below above 105 unless you are in an emergency in which case it's like 140 or something it's like the emergency so don't do it at 120 or, or 140 or whatever do it at 105 like it's supposed to or slower do it 100 do it at 80. don't use flaps if you have 8,000 foot runway why would you even use flaps use it when you need it um, they're electric flaps uh, but don't do it you're going to tear up stuff if you do it all the time at higher speeds um, otherwise green arc um, smooth air green arc or sorry bumpy air green arc smooth air yellow arc never exceed 20 205 no 202 or something is your don't don't get up you're not going to get up there unless you're diving and you lost you're, you're in bad shape if you're getting near 200 miles per hour with these e-engine they're just not that powerful so that's your airspeed indicator here's uh at least clint here's your avionics switch so you're not gonna be able to talk in your intercom or anything unless you turn this on Okay, my camera died there, so I don't know how much of that I caught. So over here, uh, Clint, for your airplane specifically, avionics is here. If you need radios and everything, um, you're going to want to turn on your avionics. And intercom and stuff is not going to work unless you turn your avionics switch on. That may be different for different airplanes. Uh, 
my dad's airplane, if the battery and master is on, everything else is on, unless maybe there's like a switch. They all have a switch somewhere around here to turn off your avionics or turn them on. Got a transponder, you got your old boat anchor, um, 170B radio, got your slightly newer boat anchor, 155. Got your audio panel, whatever. There's stuff. I'm not an instrument pilot. I don't know how to use any of this junk that is for instrument pilot. This is apparently instrument rated airplane, instrument current. I'm not gonna be able to help you with that because I do not currently have my instrument. Here's your autopilot. Use that at your own risk. Good luck. That's all I can say. I don't know why you'd need it unless you were doing long flights, but I think Clint does want to do a lot of traveling and stuff. So you might learn to use this. I think it works. I haven't tried it. I'm not going to try it because I don't trust myself. Read the manual, figure out your own systems. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, that kind of covers everything over there. Um, whatever. Instruments, these are basic. You know instruments. I don't have to walk through that. Okay, cow flaps. These are important. When you're taking off and when you're landing, cow flaps should be open. In cruise, maybe you can close them or you can run them open all the time. Look at your CHT. Um, react accordingly based on how cool the airplane is staying. Um, but anyways, these cow flaps are kind of janky right now. Um, a lot of times these will break. I'm surprised this thing's intact. Um, because a lot of times these get broken because they just get hard to pull. Lube your cables, spray some oil down in there, get some oil working into the cables. It'll keep things nice and loosey-goosey. Here's your carb heat. Don't use carb heat, okay? Why, I don't know why they have it. It's a pressure carburetor. I don't know the science behind it, but apparently from what I've read, I'm just parroting what other people say. Um, this opens an alternate air door into the engine compartment. Um, it's not officially carb heat, it just runs warm engine compartment air instead of outside air. If that gets stuck open, you're going to lose a lot of power and you're bypassing your air filter. So make sure that's working, make sure the door is shut when the carb heat... I've never, ever, ever used it, unironically. Except one time when I had an intake gasket leak and for some reason running carb heat like made stuff expand and then the, the valve seat wasn't rattling around and it actually ran better. And so I was like running, I was on my cross country, student cross country solo. Um, Figuring out things in real time there. Otherwise, I've not ever used carb heat. So don't do it. Um, maybe you will fly into icing conditions. I don't know, you're up in South Dakota. Maybe you need carb heat, but it's there. If you need it, I've never used it. If you start getting carb heat icing, try it. Maybe it'll work. Uh, but if you're south of probably South Dakota, you probably don't need it. But cow flaps, have them open. Find out. Cow flaps may be over here. They may be here. They may be wherever. Find out. It should be labeled. Find out where your cow flaps are. Uh, mixture. Look at this non-red mixture knob. Should be red. It's not. On a lot of these early bonanzas, it's not. But that's your mixture. It's not labeled. You don't know. Unless I told you. Here it is. Your mixture knob. Um, whenever you're in your Cherokee or your Cessnas or whatever, I think usually with float carburetors, when you shut off, you leave it out so that you're, you know, you don't accidentally crank the prop and start up. In bonanzas, you leave it in. Why is that? Something to do with the pressure carburetor has seals and diaphragms in it that will dry out if there's not fuel in there. So if you accidentally break down, you have it pulled out and sit there for 20 years, all your seals are going to be dried out. You want to leave this in so that there's some fuel or something in there, fumes, whatever, that is keeping things nice. It's just one of these things I do that could be an old wives' tale, but I've always been told, leave the carburetor uh, mixture in and... Uh, for at shutdown just kill it so pull it shut down okay the prop stop make sure it spins stop spinning all the way put your back in and now you can go put your airplane back away in the hangar so leave the mixture in after idle cutoff in bonanzas flaps up flaps down they may work they may not work whatever they're stupid you should cover them up i hate them they shouldn't exist um, they're useless here is where if you have the electric propeller instead of the hydraulic like this airplane does somewhere in here here or here, you would have a toggle switch. Up is high RPM, down is low RPM, whatever. Um, that would be if you had the electric propeller. This airplane has the hydraulic propeller, so you got a prop lever right here. Um, this is your starter right here. It should be labeled starter. It is. This, I don't know what that is. It's, it looks like a starter button, but maybe it's an old starter button. Maybe it's for something else. It's there. I don't know what it is. It's not labeled. How am I supposed to know what it is? Throttle. Okay, this might be different than your Cherokee or your Cessna. I don't know. I've never flown Cessnas. Cherokees, I think, have a lever. I don't know. Whatever. I don't know a lot of things. But these Bonanzas, I do know, have a vernier twist 
adjustments. So if you want to do fine little adjustments, you can twist it in. If you were on short final and you were doing twisty, twisty baloney stuff here, and I, I hear about it, I'm going to come slap you. When you are on final, you should have this button pushed and you should be doing smooth but constant adjustment because you should be able to go full power. Oh, I need to do a go around or, oh, I need to chop the power all the way out. If you're doing, oh no, I need more power. Oh, let me twist it. Oh, I got to do a go around. See how long this is taking me. Do not. It's so easy. I love this, how sensitive the RPMs are. We all love it. When I was first learning to fly, I was doing twisty, twisty all day long for takeoff. It's okay for takeoff if you like want to do a nice smooth throttle. I still think it's unnecessary. It takes way too many twists, but I'm saying on landing, you should be button pushed and whatever's comfortable. If you need this little thing to like give you more articulation, I just do this. And as long as I don't hit some terrible turbulence, I can usually keep it pretty fine. But just know that if you're in bumpy air, you might need to brace yourself. And I think Lou Gage talks about all kinds of weird methods, but essentially I find that putting the button on my palm here and then pulling with these two fingers, I can use that to depress the button. Then I can go in and out. But find the whatever works for you. All I'm saying is do not be twisting on short final. That is, you just, oh, that's a pet peeve of mine. If I see people not pushing the button on short final, I will be angry. So don't do it. A lot of you guys are probably just going to do all this stuff just to tick me off. If you guys are sending me videos and stuff, you guys fly in the wrong way, I'm going to be. Oh, how dare you. But it would be funny. I would laugh. Um, anyways, all the way out until it doesn't twist anymore. That's dead idle usually about two twists in are what I'm going to do for start. Let me go over that again in case you missed it. For start, cold start, all the way out, two complete turns, maybe three if you're feeling spunky, but roughly two, maybe a quarter inch or so in, and that's where I'm going to start. And that should get me somewhere near 1,000 RPMs for starting. Now, I've showed, people show me like, oh, yeah, I stick, here's my cold start, Arr, full throttle, or pump it, whatever, boost pump, well, like, why are you starting your airplane at full? You're going to blast whoever's tied down behind you. You're going to blast them into another dimension. You don't need to. I don't know about other airplanes, but the E engine, pull it out. One full twist, two full twists, maybe three, but no more than that. And then start to sink an airplane. Okay. Do not blast people behind you. Now that's a cold start for a hot start all the way in. And you better have that ready. Do not pump. Okay, for a whole, you will flood your engine so stinking fast. On these airplanes, if you are doing a hot start, so say you shut down, you went and talked to the line guys or whatever, or you talked to your buddy or you drop somebody off, you just shut down for 10 minutes, you come back in, it is a hot start. Do not do this little number or else you're good luck. I, although, spoiler alert, you can actually, I do my starts, even a hot start, I'll do it about right here. But that's because I know I can get on that uh, wobble pump real quick once it fires up before it dies and I can... Uh, get it started but for if you're having trouble or if you were stupid or not stupid if you just made the mistake I, I need to be less condescending if you made the mistake of accidentally pumping for a hot start like you would do for a cold start and now you flooded the engine in that case go full throttle be ready with the wobble pump do not wobble pump but be ready um, because what you're going to do is you're going to push the start button and you're gonna let it, you're gonna do a tick start, which I'll show you that when I do the actual starting video another time. This is just gonna be the ground video probably. But do your tick start. Okay, now you, there's my, that's my example of, okay, so it fires up. It'll fire up, it'll go like full throttle because you're full throttle, and then it'll immediately die. It like within a second, it'll go And what you have to do is before that prop stops spinning, you have to get on this wobble pump and you have to pump like your life depends on it to get fuel because what it'll do, it'll have had some fuel already in there. It's a hot start, there's fumes, it fires up on the fumes and then instantly runs out of gas. You didn't pump it, so there's no fuel to feed it. So what you have to do is you have to spin it all the way up on a hot start and it starts to try to die and it looks slow, slow down and you have to get on the wobble pump, pump like mad before it dies and it'll get to where it's gonna, you're gonna think it died. It'll have like one last spin and then it'll get fuel. It'll fire up and at that point, once it fires up, you better get on that throttle quick and pull it to idle, continuing to pump and pull that thing to idle. Otherwise you're gonna blow that person behind you that's tied down into another dimension. Um, so there is the hot start procedure. Hot start procedure, do not pump, do not pump. Hot start procedure, key on, master on, blah, 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 blah. Throttle, full forward. Do not pump, do, mm, do not pump. Hit your tick start, 
boom, little tick start. And then, and then it dies. Before it dies, though, when it's spinning down, you pump like crazy with your wobble pump, 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 pump. It'll come back to life. At that point, quickly pull back to idle so that you don't blow the people behind you into another dimension. That is hot start. I will demonstrate that when I'm actually running. I will do a cold start. I'll go fly around, whatever, and then I'll come back. I'll shut down. And I'll do a hot start to demonstrate. When you get really, really good, you can actually just leave it at like your three turns out or what I do when I shut down is I just leave it at like a thousand RPMs on the throttle on the RPM and shut it down and then I don't touch the throttle and then the next time I come in to start it it's already at a thousand RPMs. that's where I start it now once you get real fancy you can actually leave it at like a thousand RPMs you can do the same thing um, but instead of like running up to full RPMs it's only going to run up to a thousand RPM so it's not it's not spinning as fast it will still die on you and so you have to be quicker so the key is if you're good enough to really get on that pump quick and still save it before it dies once it fires up then you can actually start it do a, cold, a hot start with the throttle all the way out at idle just know it's harder. The reason we like to do full throttle, for one, it helps clear the in the carburetor if it's hot and you flooded it, but also that spins up faster and more spins means a longer time before the prop stops spinning when it runs out of fuel. So I don't, that was probably clear as mud. If you guys have questions, whatever, you can ask me the questions. I'll help, whatever, send me an email or something. Um, maybe it'll make more sense when I show the actual flying video. Some people, sometimes in theory, things make sense, but it's easier to watch it in practice. So that's hot start. For cold start, I don't know if I really made it clear. Cold start, two twists in, maybe three. So that should be roughly around 11 or 1,000 RPM, something like that. Then, because it's a cold start, you are going to pump. So it's cold. You just started. What am I going to do? I'm going to do about 6 to 10 to 12 pumps, depending on how good your pump is at actually pumping fuel up there. Um, it's hard to flood them on a cold start unless maybe it's really, really heat of the summer. So I found in the cool weather, just pump it six times eight times ten times whatever pick a number you like at that point you do your tick start the tick start is because the e80 starters like this one has some of them don't have it but it will kick really hard the gears are actually slightly misaligned and so you hit that button if you just ram your start button it's going to go he chung and it's going to set the gears and it can actually shear the gears in the accessory case engine system and it can actually break your gear so it's because the, the two gears are actually misaligned a little bit. So there's a little bit of play. And so it has to set those gears before it starts spinning the prop. So we call it a tick start where we go, we just barely touch it, we just barely tip and it's gonna go and then finally and you get a little chunk and you're gonna feel it and, and hear it. And that means that you did a good tick start and now the gears are set. Once the gears are set and it's actually starting to move the prop, then you can go full push and so the key is just do a tick start first so that it will set those gears. Um, I will demonstrate that when I actually start the airplane. It's going to make a lot more sense. Um, so that's a tick start. So what did we do? We pumped up six to seven pumps. We did a tick start. It's clunked. It's set in. And actually when I'm cranking, I will usually pump some more. I'll be on the pump. I'll have one finger um, hitting the starter button and the other one will be pumping over here. And then brum, 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 it should start up, no problem. Now, if you're the lazy version you and you have a boost pump, you can actually hit your boost pump instead of having to use the wobble pump. And you can crank it that way while the boost pump is running. Just don't run it too long or you could potentially, I guess, flood the engine. I like to use the wobble pump. That's what it's there for. And I'm old fashioned. I just like it. So there you go. That's the starting procedure. Cold start, three cranks uh, all the way out. One, two, three if you're feeling spunky. Tick start, near clunk. Chum, 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 pump a little bit, and then brum, 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 pump a little bit, and then once you got good fuel pressure from the engine-driven pump, you can stop pumping, and your airplane's alive, go to a thousand or less than a thousand, check your oil pressure, make sure your oil pressure come up. Same procedure you would do on any other airplane. That's the little tricks. It is not hard to start these airplanes. You just gotta figure out your plane. You don't have to do any, you don't have to like turn around twice and spit into the wind or whatever. It's not any weird voodoo magic. It's just simple throttle management, fuel pump. You got to get fuel to the engine. You got to have it cranking. So hopefully that will make more sense when I do the actual flying video. But that's starting. Um, that is pretty much the basics of, I think that's going to cover most everything until I get in the airplane and actually run the airplane. So I think that's going to do it for this video. Sorry that it was um, 
kind of convoluted. I hope it's helpful. It's too long. I was going to do it all in once, but I think I'll do a part one, which is on the ground, and then I'll do a part two where I fly. Um, so I hope this is helpful for all you guys. If uh, there's things I'm missing that are specific for other airplanes, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video.